Hi, everyone. Oh, I'm so loud. Okay, just give us a second. Okay, I think this is uh, reasonably loud. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys today about consensus. Consensus is normally a very kind of complicated pro uh, uh, problem to talk about, very complicated uh, to reason about. People often, you know, have the idea that consensus is easy because they're familiar with Bitcoin and Bitcoin is amazingly simple. Um, but, you know, like l academics have been studying consensus since like the 80s and um, it, it, it's a notoriously difficult field to get into. Actually, it turns out that Bitcoin provides us a really nice window into consensus. Um, and, and I'm kind of going to share that uh, with you in a way that's kind of general rather than just talking about Bitcoin alone. Um, and, and, sh and I'll show you kind of like how, how that's useful. And, uh, and then I'll maybe answer some questions. And then uh, if you guys want, I could go like kind of more deeply into like technical, technical stuff. Uh, I, I love Bitcoin as an educational example. It's so educational. <laughs> and I like it, you know, in other ways too, but, uh, you know, I guess I, I'm going to leave it at that just to stay, stay diplomatic. So uh, let's get started. So there, in consensus protocol research, there's this, there's this kind of really important property that people are focused on basically ever since the start. Because uh, it's a natural kind of thing. It says that uh, protocol following nodes, if they make a decision, make the same one. So consensus protocols are kind of fundamentally about different nodes making the same decision, right? Uh, and this kind of makes sense in some way um, because we want to use consensus protocols to make like a reliable system out of like many unreliable components. And somehow we want to know that like the, the ones that are reliable um, are going to give us the same result. And decisions are, are kind of final. And like all of the consensus protocols that were really like exhaustively studied uh, until Bitcoin had this kind of finality property where decisions that when they're made are final, right? Um, and uh, the Bitcoin actually is kind of interesting because it doesn't have final decisions. Any, any block could be potentially reverted if a longer blockchain comes around that doesn't have that block. And so somehow, um, Bitcoin doesn't make decisions and therefore it doesn't really seem like a consensus protocol. There are, you know, some exceptions like, you know, no matter what you do, like you'll never be able to convince a node that like this isn't the genesis block. And you also, and there's also like checkpoints, uh, but I'm not really an expert in the details, so I don't really know where and why those are. Um, but, but Bitcoin, you know, it still seems like a consensus protocol because people use it to agree on stuff even though it doesn't have this like, decision property, right? And so people have kind of felt like, oh, maybe Bitcoin just isn't consistent, and inconsistent consensus protocols uh, you know, have existed for a while. Sorry, inconsistent means that it's not safe because nodes make different decisions, i.e. inconsistent decisions. And so um, somehow well, we, we, we're struggling to understand how and why Bitcoin is a consensus protocol because it doesn't actually satisfy the original definition of consensus. Instead, uh, Bitcoin has another notion of safety. The notion of safety in Bitcoin is basically that, like, I will never see a heavier chain that doesn't include this block. So, like, maybe once a block gets down, like, six, ten blocks, like, it'll, I'll never ever in the future of time see a longer chain that doesn't have that block. And somehow, that's a very different definition than consensus safety because it doesn't tell you about whether nodes will agree. It just says whether, like, my node will ever change its mind. But somehow, it is related because... Uh, you know, if you have a chain that's longer that doesn't include this block than my chain, then if you ship me that chain, then I'll change my mind, and I won't have the safety property. And somehow, so 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 somehow the, there is going to be consensus coming out of this safety property, which is entirely locally defined as the fact that like a block won't be reverted for this node that like you're running, right? And so and so I kind of call this estimate safety. An estimate is, unlike a decision, it's not finalized. It can be, re it can be re kind of revised, and, and you can maybe end up changing an estimate later. Um, so uh, we have this definition of estimate safety, which is kind of like a really simple definition. Um, a protocol following nodes, estimate is safe if it won't be revised. So somehow, like, if, it'll if an estimate will never change, then that estimate is safe, even though, like, um, you know, estimates are kind of defined as something that can change. So like they can change until maybe they're safe and then they can't. Um, so, uh, he, so, 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 you know, this is a simple definition and this is kind of a simple definition also. Um, but, you know, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to relate them for you. 
Um, but actually, um, bef before I do, I should look, I give a little disclaimer that I'm, I'm kind of operating at a pretty high level of abstraction here. I, I, I could be making these definitions a lot more detailed, you know, parametric and stuff like, oh, is a network synchronous or asynchronous? Is it partially synchronous? Oh, are there Byzantine faults? Are there crash faults? You know, um, I, I, I could be adding these things to every one of these definitions and tagging them along through the whole discussion, but I think it's not really useful for, like, learning for the first time. And so, I'm, so I've, I've simplified the definitions and ignored the fact that, like, the network might be different or there might be some number of faulty nodes uh, and the faults might be different. Uh, so, so we have two simple definitions. I'm just going to go over them again for, for, for everyone's benefit. So they are consensus safety. If two nodes follow the protocol and they make decisions, they're going to be the same one. And estimate safety, which is that um, a node's estimate won't change in the future once it has estimate safety. So, one, so somehow there's a, big, there's a big difference between them because uh, estimate safety you know, a node needs to already have an estimate for it to be safe, whereas like a protocol has consensus safety on kind of a kind of global basis. So, um, I'm gonna, so basically, so basically we, we, we kind of uh, have uh, this, an, a really tight relationship between cons estimate safety and consensus safety in the context of um, what I call deterministic estimates. So, uh, so a, a protocol has deterministic, deterministic estimates. If any two nodes having received the same set of messages have the same estimate. So like if you and I receive the same set of blockchains, we'll each choose the same longest blockchain. Uh, it doesn't matter what order we receive the chains in. So as long as we kind of have this property, then there's a really nice and tight, uh, tight uh, relationship between estimate safety and consensus safety, namely that Protocol following nodes that only make decisions on safe estimates have consensus safety. So if decisions are only made on safe estimates, then those decisions will have consensus safety. And so this like, really simple statement bridges estimate safety with consensus safety and lets us do some, some cool stuff. But first, let me um, try to show you kind of intuitively, but very much along the lines of the actual proof uh, that, that this is true. So somehow, if I'm, a if I'm a protocol following node, and you're a protocol following mode node, and you ship me all of your messages, and if my estimate was safe, then, then your messages won't have any effect on my estimate, right? Like you aren't able to give me a, cha a chain that doesn't have this block, it, that is also longer than my blocks, uh, my chain, and so I won't, my, my estimate won't change. So again, so if I'm a protocol following node and you're a protocol following node and my estimate is safe, then even if you send me all of the messages you've ever received, my estimate won't change. And vice versa, if you have a, a safe estimate and I send you all the messages I've ever received, you won't change your estimate. However, um, you know, if I send you all the messages I've received and you send me all the messages you've received, at the end, we can have the same set of messages, namely like the union of our initial views. Uh, and after this process, we will have the same estimate by this property that I gave earlier, this determinism property, which said just exactly this. If we have the same, seen the same set of messages, then we'll have the same estimate. So somehow, if my estimate is safe and yours is safe, then neither of us can convince each other by sending all of our messages to each other to change our estimates. But at the end of this process, we'll have the same estimate. And if we have the same estimate at the end, and, at the be and from the beginning to the end we never changed our estimates, then it must have been the case that we had the same estimates at the start. And that's it. That's kind of the proof. So, you know, it's a really simple, elegant proof, given abstractly like this. If you get into, like, all of the details, it gets a little more complex, but it's got the same, pretty much exactly the same shape. Um, so again, let me just state the proof again. So, you know, if I have a safe estimate and you have a safe estimate and I ship to you everything I've seen and you ship to me everything you've seen, neither of us change our mind, but at the end we have the same estimate because we've each seen the same messages, then that must mean that at the start we each had the same estimates. So we, if we each have a safe estimate, then we have the same estimate. And so this means that if we were to decide on these estimates, then we would have consensus safety because the definition of consensus safety is that our decisions are on the same on the same values, or our decisions are the same, to put it a little more simply. So, it's really cool because it lets us talk about Bitcoin in the context of consensus. We can say that, like, oh, look, if we just wait for a large enough number of blocks, 
Um, that, that, so, or let me phrase it differently. If we look at our blocks at like some, some height and we wait for large, large enough blocks, then um, well, they're, they're going to be safe, which means that we're each going to have the same blocks at that, at, that, at that height. And so this lets us kind of quite easily reason about how we could turn Bitcoin, which is not a consensus protocol of the traditional definition, into one that is with a very trivial rule that says like, oh look, after you know, I get so many blocks deep, I'm not going to revert. So imagine if your Bitcoin client refused to revert more than six blocks. It just like, you know, it didn't matter if you got a longer chain that didn't have that block six blocks down, you just would not revert. Um, this now, if you made this change to the protocol, which is a very simple change, it would be a consensus protocol by the original definition, and uh, somehow that's really neat because it lets us talk about how Bitcoin is a consensus protocol almost. And so somehow Bitcoin is, has like a weaker notion of consensus that's somehow a little bit more broad in the sense that like, oh look, we can add this thing and now it has consensus. But um, you know, somehow, even before we, before we added that, it, we, were, we could easily use it to agree. Um, but un unless, unless we can detect estimate safety, then, then maybe we, we, we don't know how to make decisions. But thankfully, Bitcoin gives us a really simple way to detect safety, which is basically to say like, oh look, somehow the more confirmations we have, the more safe we are. And the other thing, the thing that's really cool about this, the thing that I've had like such a fun time with, is the idea that we can construct consensus protocols by building a protocol that has, that basically makes estimates, and giving nodes a way to locally determine whether or not an estimate is safe. So kind of if we do this, then we can kind of make these consensus protocols, like I call them like correct by construction protocols, because they're derived in a way that guarantees that they have consensus safety just by virtue of satisfying this proof that I gave you. So far, I've made four consensus protocols to satisfy the scheme. Uh, first one I did was like on a bit, and then like some many months later, I figured out how to do one with an ordinal number, and then a little shorter time after that on a blockchain, and then a short, even shorter time after that on, a, on an arbitrary rewrite system. And so, like you know, I would love to talk about these things um, because they're they're super cool. And basically, to do this, we basically have to do a few things. One of them is we have to like define the underlying data structures, define what estimates are, and then implement a way for nodes to tell locally if their estimates are safe. And then we're kind of done, uh, because after that, we can make we can just add, relatively trivially add a decision that's a, a decision rule that says, look, once we have safety, then uh, we're kind of cool uh, to decide on this value. So basically, uh, you know, now I'm like happy to take some questions. And then, if you guys want, um, I'm going to go go through these, like each of the, each or some of these four protocols that I've kind of derived to satisfy this proof. Um, so, you know, do we have a microphone? Uh, we have two microphones. Do we have volunteers to kind of move to? Pa oh yeah, do you want to pass it around, Austin? Th thanks a lot. So, so you know. Uh, I'll just take questions until you guys are done, and then if we're, or until Hello. someone requests that, like, I start drawing stuff. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, could you briefly describe uh, Ethereum consensus from this point of view, both the current version, proof of work, and the forthcoming Casper? How do they comply with the consensus uh, defined in this sure. way? So um, basically, the, the current, the current Ethereum. Uh, complies in exactly the same way that Bitcoin does because it uses proof of work with relatively minor changes. Um, in, so in, in terms of the proof of stake rollout, we have a kind of tiered rollout plan, right? So at first we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to have like a, a finality gadget on top of the proof of work blockchain that uh, finalizes but like leaves the proof of work behind. And then we're going to upgrade further, getting rid of the blockchain and maybe, maybe moving to something that's uh, more along these lines. The, the, the finality gadget actually is uh, very much like a traditional consensus protocol. It's kind of not too much unlike PBFT or Tendermint. It uses like a two-phase commit process where you have like repairs and commits and actually is derived in a very different way and the safety proof looks very different. So the first rollout of the proof of stake consensus protocol is not going to satisfy these proofs. Instead it satisfies like another proof. And, and that's basically just um, uh, because it's, it's, somehow, it's somehow easier and we're going to be able to roll it out faster. And you know, because we want to move to proof of stake as soon as possible because somehow uh, it's way better than proof of work. <laughs> Sorry, did I heard you correctly? You said that at some point you will move from blockchain for Casper to something else? No, it's just more like Casper 2.0, 3.0. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, questions? Questions? Uh, thank you, Vlad. Uh, uh, I want to ask uh, what is the uh, biggest challenge, uh, to your opinion, in the uh, designing of proof of stakes protocols or challenges in uh, uh, tasks uh, that you work on? Sure. So, um, so proof of stake is like a, a, a pro from the way that I understand proof of stake is a problem of crypto economics applied to consensus protocols. So we want to kind of incentivize and make like a good good incentive mechanism design for a consensus protocol. And you know it turns out that both consensus protocols and incentive mechanisms are very difficult to design. They have like difficult problems, right? And so uh, you know I think that like it's hard for me to say what is more difficult. Uh, at this point, because like I don't have like that many like big open question marks about these about this process, um, and so everything seems like kind of you know as difficult as doing the work, but it's not really that, like a big unknown factor. But let me say that like um, you know we, we, I, I kind of spent maybe just as much time working on the economic problems as the consensus problem. It's like it's really hard for me to tell. So. Um, I would say that consensus is actually conceptually a lot more difficult than uh, than crypto economics, you know. Or I would have said that until I came up with this proof, and now somehow I think it's not that bad. But uh, the proofs of safety for uh, like a round-based consensus protocol, like PBFT, Paxos, is actually much more complex uh, than this proof that I showed here. Uh, and so normally consensus is actually I think very 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 challenging, and maybe maybe arguably more challenging than. Um, some of the incentive stuff. I mean, if you were at the BIP yesterday, I gave a talk about crypto economics and kind of showed the tools that we use there. And kind of once we are equipped with some of these tools, it ends up being considerably easier, right? If we can do fault attribution, if we have security deposits, then um, incentivizing a protocol is, is, is incentivizing adherence to a protocol is not that hard, but actually doing fault attribution is, 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 can, can be quite tricky. Um, thankfully though, um, for uh, because consensus protocols are extremely objective, um, we can check the validity of messages on the wire, and we can um, therefore tell if someone made an invalid message. There's basically only uh, and and there's, you know, but if someone kind of made a message here and a message there that contradict, then that like that's also detectable if we see both of them. Um, the only thing that's really kind of very tricky is the fact that uh, if we have a lock, lack of liveness, uh, then it's not clear who precisely caused the faults. So, and, and, that, and that's, and, and, and li liveness is actually something I didn't talk about in this talk, and is actually maybe the most difficult thing in terms of consensus, and also in terms of incentivization. So safety is quite nice because any faults that lead to safety failures end up being detectable. But uh, faults that lead to liveness failures end up being quite difficult to detect. Um, liveness is something I didn't define here, but a, a consensus liveness means that nodes eventually come to a decision. Uh, estimate liveness means that nodes eventually have estimate safety. And somehow, um, uh, proving liveness is way harder than proving safety. And incentivizing liveness is way harder than incentivizing safety. So I would say actually that uh, I have an answer now. The hard thing is liveness. Very good. Oh, Vlad, hello. I want Hi. to ask you about well, uh, what do you think? Uh, what's the pr probability of creation you Ethereum Classic when you run proof of stake? Uh, because uh, I think it's not impossible. Yeah. So, so basically, as like a general rule, when you have a hard fork that's like somewhat contentious, there needs to be kind of a critical mass of the community or of some community somewhere who strongly feels that their side is right and are unwilling to compromise in order to be with their peers. And, and so somehow uh, uh, it's a question of whether the, there is enough people, like a critical mass of people who like oppose proof of stake. And you know, uh, I'm actually not that, I don't think it's that likely because I don't know that like the market can support Ethereum Classic, Ethereum Classic, Classic and Ethereum. Um, um, but um, it might. But somehow I just think that the miners will move to other coins and um, and like other and like the Ethereum Classic. Um, but basically, it's going to be a matter of like whether or to what extent is contentious, and to what extent is or how many people 
are like really against it in a way that like is somehow something they're unwilling to compromise on. Um, so I don't think the high probability is too high. I think it will depend actually mostly on our ability to communicate clearly about the benefits of proof of stake. I think um, the main reason why people like still ha like proof of work over proof of stake is that they don't understand proof of stake and they don't understand all the all the benefits associated with it. So maybe I'll take this moment to talk about the benefits of proof of stake. Um, you know, everyone kind of has like a slightly different order in which they prioritize the benefits. But for me, the number one great thing about proof of stake is that it lets us do mechanism design in the context of highly concentrated markets. If you have a cartel with more than 50% of mining power and they censor other miners, the protocol can't detect that at all because proof of work is external to the protocol. Whereas if you have like a stakers who censor uh, censor other stakers, the protocol can see that the people who expected to make blocks aren't making blocks. And this lets us kind of hold uh, this cartel to account. Somehow, um, proof of stake is much more suitable for doing mechanism design in oligopolistic context because we have a higher degree of accountability of, to nodes. And so to me, that's the most exciting thing because to me, the big challenge in cryptocurrency is uh, power concentration and, and making sure that the concentration of power doesn't lead to uh, failure of our guarantees. The next most interesting thing to me is transaction finality. Transaction finality, I think, is really cool. I think non-reversible decisions are really cool. Because if a decision is non-reversible, then, and, and my node has made that decision, there's nothing you can do in the world, no matter how much you spend, to change my node's decision. Right? It just like, is like, like incapable of changing its mind, because like, you know, it just like did that locally. Um, and so, and so the, if, if all of our nodes make the same decision, then an adversary, can't spend, no matter how much money they spend, to revert those blocks. And somehow this lets us do things that uh, aren't, really, aren't really possible in the context where an adversary could spend a bunch of money to revert those blocks. Because, uh, so for example, like if, imagine we want to like clear like a very massive transaction. It, you know, it might, it might get censored for a while, potentially, because like there's a cost you can pay to censor it. But if it ever gets finalized, then there is no cost anymore that you can pay to unfinalize it. And so the cost of double spend becomes kind of unbounded. And so it, it becomes possible for us to settle very, very large value transactions. We can have a, a really clear argument for why the blockchain can support way more economic activity than is kind of going into the process of, of the consensus protocol. And so somehow we can have like a relatively cheap consensus securing a huge amount of activity. And that's kind of the dream to me, right? I want to have like consensus represent the minimum piece of the economy, right? Because like we don't want to be paying too much for this service. It should be like as efficient as possible. Um, and so finality to me is like really this, probably the second most exciting thing about proof of stake. Maybe another more, more exciting thing is that uh, blocks don't need to come in a Poisson process. They can kind of come at a more regular rate which is a good thing for user experience. You don't need to wait an unpredictable amount of time. Something that people care about a lot, and I care about too, but is near the bottom of my list, is this whole like, oh, look, we don't need to waste electricity thing. I mean, I think that's you know, a pretty big deal ecologically speaking, but it's not necessarily a big deal to like, clients who don't really care about the environment. Um, but some, and somehow like, clients are at the top of my list when I think about uh, blockchain architecture. And so you know, I think if people, the more people realize the benefits of proof of stake, the less contentious the transition will be, and the less likely we are to have a significant faction of the community not want to split. However, I think there's a huge incentive on the behalf of miners who are getting paid on the order of like, you know, seven, six, whatever, five million dollars a day to, you know, mine Ethereum right now. I think they have a really strong incentive to like spread FUD to try to um, make this, the, the transition not happen or make there be a chain like that spins off because all that stuff just benefits them. And so somehow I think that miners and people who are like funded by miners are actually a bigger threat than say people who like genuinely believe that proof of work is better than proof of stake. Um, because like, you know, you can argue with uh, on uh, people who, who like need to have like, you know, intellectual opinions, but are, you know, happy to be convinced. It's really hard to argue with someone's incentives, right? If someone really believes, so if someone doesn't really care what the facts are, but just wants to make as much money for themselves as possible, it's harder to convince them that like, proof of stake is a good deal because like, they're not going to make as much money. Um, any other questions? Uh, Vlad, uh, what is Ethereum? Uh, I mean, uh, not uh, Wikipedia-like uh, definition or white paper definition, uh, more philosophic, uh, your personal uh, vision of this. Uh, and uh, uh, what Ethereum uh, 2027, uh, 10 years from now? 
have you a joint uh, vision with your core team? Uh, tell about these two questions. Right. Um, so the first thing I say, I guess, is that it's kind of hard to tell what people will use Ethereum for because it's kind of general purpose and it kind of can do anything. But I can tell you my personal kind of philosophy on the matter, right? I mean, like, I think that Ethereum is for uh, solving problems that can't be solved with a jurisdictional computer. So like if you have like if you have like a computer that exists in one jurisdiction and somehow there's like some reason you can't tr you can't solve a problem with that because like maybe uh, you know you can't trust it because like for, for like you know because like there's one person operating it or like one judge that can shut it down. Um, you know, like if being a blockchain, it's non-jurisdictional, and I think that, like, therefore, it's for solving problems that computers solve, but which can't be solved in a particular jurisdiction. So I'm thinking about kind of um, things like, say, um, uh, you know, providing bases for like a, a global uh, global solutions to problems of like mutual distrust. Also, things like uh, circumvention of systems of control. Um, there's a whole, but basically, you, to me, the core of any blockchain is the non-jurisdictionality, and like Ethereum is basically a non-jurisdictional computer, and hopefully by 2027, it's going to be scalable, uh, and so, you know, uh, so who really knows what people will use it for? But I think that like uh, the, uh, you know, that's like the main, the main benefit. The, the other thing that Ethereum I think is useful for is the fa is reducing coordination costs due to having fewer counterparties. So somehow you need to make fewer contracts, have fewer counterparties if you deploy an app on Ethereum. Like I can maybe write an app, deploy it. I don't need to like have an account with Amazon, or I don't need to have a contract with someone who will run it. I don't need to hire someone to run it. It'll, I just need to like pay fees. And so there's actually some uh, significant economic gains that come from reduced coordination costs and therefore reduced transaction costs uh, that are also, I think, a pretty big deal. Uh, but somehow I think that's less compelling than the non-jurisdictionality. Um, uh, in terms of how people disagree, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really imagine that anyone would disagree with that, but I also... I don't know, this isn't something we really talk about, right? We just talk about the tech, we don't really... We talk about what it's for, like, rarely. Rarely. <laughs> More questions? Hey Vlad, thank you very much. Um, the latest run of thousands of ICOs on Ethereum blockchain caused a lot of uh, interesting problems and um, uh, yeah, learnings maybe. The question is what are the key learnings and uh, if they influenced their feature roadmap or development roadmap? Yeah, um, so, the, so basically um, we, we, we have learned, I mean, so we've collectively learned quite a lot. I mean like one of the things is like some of us learned that Ethereum isn't scalable. Um, we learned a, a bunch of things about like how to do ICO design and what things are kind of bad policies. Like for example, having a maximum gas price that you accept is like a bad policy because the equilibrium there is for everyone to just make a million accounts and send a million transactions to just span the network. Because you can't get ahead of the line by bidding a higher price, you have to get ahead of the line by having more places in the line. And that somehow encourages spam. And so we've learned a lot of interesting stuff about, how, about token sales and how not to do token sales. Uh, we've, I mean, I've been, I've been shocked at like the kind of uh, numbers that we've seen that are being raised, and like that was a surprise to me. So I guess, you know, if surprise is learning, then I, I guess I learned something. Uh, um, but basically, uh, in terms of the roadmap, the main thing that it has done is it pushed uh, scalability up the priority list um, because you know now that we've now that our scaling problems are kind of more imminent and pressing than they were just like a few months ago. Um, you know, we're thinking about, say, like rolling out a version of sharding that doesn't shard consensus but charges validation and storing and therefore somehow provides some degree of scalability before uh, all of the tough problems are solved. Um, that's still, I mean, that's not a guaranteed. We're, we still have like questions and we need to work on it. But definitely uh, sharding has moved up the priority list a bit. Um, and uh, also, uh, certain types of changes to the EVM that make it more efficient to execute. Uh, you know, we, we increased the, the uh, I mean, the miners increased the gas limit by like 40%. Uh, 
uh, over the last like few weeks. So that was significant. Um, and honestly, kind of scary to me because it happened so fast that like I could I could see the miners raising the gas limit to a point where it's like unsafe, and like we could see some significant concentration in the network, people's nodes going down. Um, but uh, so it definitely has changed what the future looks like a bit. Um, but you know, I wasn't I wasn't shocked that Ethereum isn't scalable. Questions. Anyone? Anyone? I have a question. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. No, no, you go for it. Go for it. Yeah, what percentage of uh, these projects funded with these latest uh, round of ICOs are actually going to uh, ship a product and work? Um, I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, so ship a product and so ship, shipping a product and work doesn't mean that your product is useful, right? Uh, and so and so I think I think you're probably trying to ask like how many of them are going to be successful. And I think probably like very few of them, but that's just a hypothesis based on like the rates of startup failure. Uh, I'm not actually sure if a startup, you know, with one million dollars is more or less likely to fail than one with a hundred million dollars, even though it's the same team. Like you know, uh, uh, maybe maybe it's less likely to fail. So maybe the start, the rates of failure will be like a little bit lower than in normal startup land. Um, but definitely like. I think that say like you know a hundred startups each with a million dollars are likely to have bigger successes than like one startup with a hundred million dollars, but you know just a thought. What do you think? Like a lot of these, uh, especially some of these more recent ones, seem to be kind of um, a little more contrived. Let's say I don't know if you'd agree with that. That kind of uh, they're kind of pushing the limits of um, the balance between. Uh, Efficiency and and the need for decentralization and uh, do you well you know I mean I haven't I mean I don't follow all of them I, it's hard to keep up but I, I can only imagine that you're right but I, I I like I definitely like you know I haven't I haven't read most of their white papers or looked at most of what they do but certainly um, I have heard criticisms that like you know anecdotally suggest that you're probably right well can I ask you this then what uh, what if you could broadly describe what types of applications or services or products need to be decentralized? Oh, uh, that's that's an interesting question. So I would guess, um, well, so anything that like needs to be non-jurisdictional, easy answer. Uh, a h harder answer, is, like a slightly more interesting answer, is anything that is uh, more economically viable if it's decentralized. Um, which you know kind of goes back to this earlier point that I had about transaction costs and lowering the number of counterparties and reducing counterparty risk. Um, and so, so sometimes it does make sense to decentralize something just because of the kind of trusted nature of the blockchain. Well, can you uh, can you then maybe uh, speak a sentence or two about what the trade-off is, which seems to be like maybe in this hype cycle people aren't quite realizing that there's a Maybe there's not, maybe there's not, but that perhaps there might be a trade-off to uh, decentralizing things and asking the entire world to uh, run your service? Um, well, there are trade-offs. Uh, I mean, surely, I mean, most people are not used to paying fees every time they use an application, right? Users are used to getting things for free and seeing ads, not paying like high fees. Here, they're going to have to pay fees instead. Um, that's like one trade-off that's kind of major. Uh, uh, in terms of the trade-offs between like doing ICO funding versus other kinds of funding, um, I'm not sure if you're asking about that. Or what about the, the, the application? Level? Okay, so you're just asking about the like utility of the applications. LinkedIn yeah. Versus yeah. LinkedIn right. And so well, I think actually one of the most underappreciated trade-offs between centralized and decentralized apps is that decentralized apps um, are much more prone to abuse and much more difficult to build, to build in things that prevent abuse. So like pretty much every centralized app you've ever seen has like, oh, like you know, whenever you see a message from someone, you can like report them and like, and like block them. And, and there's like a really good reason for this, right? Um, but for decentralized apps, I think people are both thinking about ab abuse less and realizing less that abuse is more serious in decentralized context because of censorship resistance. So I think like that's probably one of the, one of the bigger ones. Um, but. I think I think the main the main trade-off that people normally focus on, and that's like right to focus on, is like between like kind of efficiency and scalability that you would get in a centralized system, and the kind of relative inefficiency and unscalability uh, that the blockchain currently provides. Um, if you're building a proof of concept, you're not gonna have many clients. Maybe it's okay that it's not scalable, but uh, more generally speaking, you know. Um, yeah, there's there's definitely a reduction in performance that you get from going onto the blockchain. 
in terms of throughput. Yeah. Uh, can we get the mic passed? Oh, never mind. One more question first, Anthony. Um, I, I just thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm working. <laughs> I'm working for a big project, and uh, we have one problem with um, cost management. Uh, especially with uh, the price of board, cross-boarding transaction and uh, unfunding, uh, delaying of uh, um, pays and so on. And uh, I'm looking for such technology of making temporary currency, maybe cryptocurrency, uh, with uh, some technology of temporary proof of stake and uh, making useful works and uh, without miners only maybe like like such, such, such protocol like uh, proof of useful work maybe uh, uh -huh. when, when you making uh, such sure. work in, in project and uh, making some money for it yes? but uh, then a project uh, finished uh, all this currency will be burned and because of pr proof of burn we uh, all, all the stakeholders took their uh, real money. Okay, so what's, sorry, what's maybe, the question? Maybe you know uh, such uh, current, such technology of making this uh, temporary currency. Well, um, so I mean, I don't know that it really takes new technology to make a temporary currency. I mean, basically it's a matter of making like a, a chain or something that has like a time to live. It's really, uh, it, uh, you know, I think it's, I think you just kind of program in the, 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 the time to live and make sure, and like have a, you know, a system where after some time, uh, everything shuts down and all the currency gets burned. And I've, I've, I've looked at blo I look, I've looked at systems where you kind of have like a variable number of side chains that are each short lived in order to meet kind of growing and f like fluctuating demand. But um, you know, I don't I don't know of any like existing projects that offer this stuff. But I would say that like something that you said uh, did kind of make me a little uneasy, namely that you said, okay, like, pr like we're gonna have proof of useful work, and then you also said that the useful work would be done by people using the application. Normally, proof of useful work is understood as something like, let's do some, like, instead of hashing, let's find some prime numbers, which is very different. Yeah, so, 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 but so, so somehow pr proof of work is about hashing or about some kind of proof of resource that you have, which is very different than proof of, say, like, con contribution to the application. And I think there's a, people have this, like, bad idea that they want the people who contribute to also be the ones to run the servers. I think that like the, those skill sets are usually very different, right? The skill set to keep a server online all the time and like, make sure it's connected and, uh, is very different from the skill set required to, impl uh, that to like, actually contribute to the application. And so somehow um, you, should, you shouldn't, you should, I think as a general principle, separate out roles uh, and give those roles to people whose core competency is to, do the, to fill those roles. Um, so that's, I guess that's okay. my main comment there. Hey Vlad, nice presentation. Uh, just a quick question on other co tech that other coins are using. What do you find interesting and uh, what are you keeping your eye on these days? Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I mostly am like consistently disappointed with other coins and other tech. And so, and so I don't have very much nice to say. I think most projects just completely ignore a mechanism design and, and like uh, incentive questions. Just like completely ignore them. And just kind of uh, like mostly assume that almost everyone is going to be honest. Just try to show that if a small number of them are dishonest, it'll be okay. Ring signatures or sure. Okay, so what do I think about ring signatures and Schnorr? So, oh, actually crypto. I love cryptography and cryptography stuff. I'm not a cryptographer, but I do think they're really cool. But in terms of like, if I look at the consensus protocols, like the different proof of stake coins and stuff, I find them like very scary. I think so. For example, something like Tezos, which basically like just embraces plutocracy, has like you know, basically like kind of ignored their interesting incentive alignment and kind of mechanism design questions by basically saying you know, the coins are going to be great for everyone, uh, and, I, and I really don't think that plutocracy is great for everyone. Um, Next question. Yeah, okay. Hey, Vlad, I got your thoughts on um, uh, hard sync on uh, liveness uh, incentivizing. And uh, uh, from the point of view of designing the balance of incentivizations from the safety point, uh, what is the most hardest thing? Uh, I think it's uh, some kind of uh, cartelizing, but. Uh... Ah, so actually, uh, it's really, really shockingly easy to even against cartels deal with safety problems so safety is per safety faults in asynchronous consensus protocols are 
perfectly attributable. Like I can tell exactly who's guilty, and I can take away their whole deposit. And like it doesn't matter if you have 80% of the stake or 10, I could see it's you and take all your money away. And so somehow safety, dealing with sa dealing with concentration and safety is is relatively very easy compared to the liveness thing. Uh, somehow there's like only one thing to do, which is like the maximum penalty, and there's only one person who could have done it. And so it's, it's, it, it ends up being a pretty natural decision there. The next question, please. Um, maybe so we don't have to deal with the feedback, we'll just turn the mic off and I'll repeat the questions. Because uh, it's starting to get crazy. Anyone? 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 Okay, well. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh-huh. Okay, great. So the question is in 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 2027 when 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 Ethereum scales and everything is fantastic, does does Bitcoin have any role or 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 is it or is it done? I mean, so I mean the 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 the, the so like assuming that Bitcoin doesn't change and stays the way it is today, I mean, I think it's done by that point. Assuming that Bitcoin does have significant protocol changes, uh it could survive. I mean, anything's possible at that point. But if we just believe that like Bitcoin is going to be as is in another ten years, I mean, I don't, I don't really, I don't, I don't really see it surviving for a number of reasons. But mostly because um, I think, I think that like the mining economics are unsustainable. Uh, and I, th I think that like the fact that Bitcoin isn't robust to cartelization is kind of like a fatal flaw. Like, you know, people normally think about, okay, well, when the block rewards fall, there's going to be fees only, and that might be an issue. And that's fair enough. Um, uh, the lack of, fin uh, but I think that's mostly a problem due to the lack of finality. Um, so if you were to add a rule like, oh, look, we won't revert more than 10 blocks, then somehow I think even with really low, even with fees that are relatively low compared to the total amount of Bitcoins that are circulating, that it won't be a problem because like you can't double spend more than 10 blocks. And so if you, so, but that, again, there's one of these changes, but, but so, so if, if you could always double spend an arbitrary number of blocks and the block rewards go to zero and the fees are not that high compared to the amount of Bitcoins transacted, then, and there's also concentrated mining power, then like, I don't see why we won't see it get attacked. Um, and basically, because I, I personally like don't really believe that uh, miners and user and the, pro the community's protocol, uh, sorry, community slash protocol's interests are aligned, right? I mean, there is a chance that like Jihan will be like the one miner forever, and he'll always be honest. Uh, but somehow, I think it's more likely that like someone will coerce him into attacking Bitcoin, or maybe that he'll just find it profitable to attack Bitcoin. Uh, so you know, with protocol changes, and I think they could potentially be minor. Uh, I think Bitcoin could have a role in 2027. With no protocol changes, I'm skeptical, but mostly because of this this analysis, right? I mean. Um, and, 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 and finding a vulnerability is much easier than conducting an exploit, right? Like crypto sometimes, sometimes people find flaws in crypto and then many years later is it ever exploited. And I think the same, same thing kind of goes for these arguments where I think there are pretty clear vulnerabilities, pretty clear suboptimalities. Whether or not they're gonna be exploited, I mean basically has to do with whether there's enough incentive to exploit them. And I only expect that incentive to grow. Yeah. So the question is, like I mentioned, Tendermint, um, you know, and uh, like, uh, like, w w what is kind of the plan, uh, you know, uh, with, like with respect to including or using Tendermint, and also like, interoperability with Ethereum chains that are using Tendermint right now. And basically, uh, well, so I mentioned Tendermint, and, and and I just said that like you know our finality gadget is kind of like Tendermint, which is kind of like PBFT. I would say. Yeah, so I'm kind of I'm kind of getting getting there. So PBFT is a is a traditional fault tolerant consensus protocol that requires like has like one third fault tolerance and is kind of relatively complex. Tendermint is 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 kind of a modification is like somehow significantly simpler than that, and it's a modification of this protocol called DLS. DLS, I think it's DLS. Uh, it's also another consensus protocol that somehow sim is like simpler than uh, PBFT. Um, the cast with the finality gadget is kind of simpler than Tendermint and fits on top of a blockchain. 
So it's kind of like, instead of having all of the stuff that's in Tendermint, it has less stuff because it's able to ride on the blockchain a little bit. And so it has like fewer rounds, less, like less messages, less states that the nodes can be in. And so it's like Tendermint in the sense that, like this, that the, it tolerates the same number of faults, it has the same like liveness and safety properties, um, but it's not like Tendermint in that, you know, it's not Tendermint. Uh, but somehow it, it, the uh, like SVP proofs, so which is like simplified payment verification proofs for Tendermint and for okay, the Finality gadget look pretty much the same. You just have to get like from two thirds of the weight, and, like commit messages. Um, so interoperability is really easy because these SPV proofs are very simple. And that's the really cool thing about tr finality is that like instead of having to do interoperability by like waiting for a million blocks like for days because like otherwise there might be a reversion, uh, you can just use this, the consensus signature which ends up being like messages from like two thirds of the nodes by weight in Tendermint and also in the finality gadget. So interoperability is gonna be like easier However, you know, I still don't think that interoperability is anywhere close to where it needs to be to be a great, elegant solution. Because for interoperability, you basically need to implement clients that, are, that kind of can interpret each other's chains. And at the moment, we don't have a good enough understanding of consensus in order to implement a general client that can, ar that can, ar that can, ar that can kind of authenticate an arbitrary consensus protocol. And this means that every client, that every interop client has to have like a bunch has to understand a bunch of different consensus protocols, and somehow that's like not that elegant. Polkadot. And Polkadot, uh, I mean, I haven't looked too much at Polkadot, um, um, but basically uh, they also use a traditional consensus protocol in like kind of a, for like the core and like also maybe some of the side chains. Um, and basically, I'm also unenthusiastic about it for the same reason. Um, and 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 uh, you know, generally, I think these these consensus protocols with a one third bound are actually really not great because I think that one third bound is, all, is, is almost a complete nonsense result. And here's why, this is super controversial, but um, well, the way that the proof works is it says that, okay, to, to have both safety and liveness for a consensus protocol, the most Byzantine faults that you can tolerate is a third. And the way that it works is kind of like, you can, in, if to show, the, show liveness, you assume that all the Byzantine faults are offline, all the Byzantine nodes are offline. To show safety, you, sh you assume that all of the Byzantine nodes are committing like safety faults, use equivocation. But a node can't both be offline and be committing one of these faults. And so somehow they've, they, they've like double spent their Byzantine faults in this proof that says like a third is the lower bound. And the reason why they do that is because they kind of start from, the, from an initial blank state of the protocol and say we have to have safety and liveness from here. And so like you could have a place where safety fails or where, where liveness fails. But if we were to say instead, talk about safety and liveness as a function of a particular protocol state, as a, instead of as a function of the protocol globally, then we can get to a state where like say, we, we can tolerate like 50% faults in, or 80, 90, even like, not, like all N bus one faults from this particular state um, if for safety. Uh, but obviously if we had N minus one nodes that are offline, we would never be able to get there. But since we're already at that state, there's no question of liveness, because kind of we're already there, right? And 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 so the so when you when you think about safety and liveness in the in the context of particular protocol states, which is actually demanded by the estimate safety definition, then you can kind of get a get a hint that uh, this one third bound is o only applies to the protocol globally, starting from an empty kind of state or like an initial state, as opposed to being uh, something that's kind of fundamental for uh, consensus protocol, um, and, and 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 so like I don't really believe in these protocols. I don't think they're like the best ever. I think they're like suboptimal. And I think the optimal thing to do is to make protocols that maximize estimate safety, and then to have clients make decisions like kind of on the edges, right? So the core protocol just maximizes estimate safety, and then you can decide locally if you if you're happy with making a decision with estimate safety that tolerates a third fault or a half fault or a quarter fault. Um, and I think that's kind of a, a much better model because then well, you, can, you can kind of be optimistic. You can kind of see if you can get crazy amounts of safety and, and only accept that. And then maybe if you can't because of the liveness issues, then you accept the lower amount. And somehow that's, this will let us tolerate many more Byzantine faults than just a third in like a like kind of normal case. Um, and so, you know, those, those are kind of my thoughts about those projects. Basically, I think a lot of these people are kind of leaning on uh, traditional consensus protocol literature, whereas I'm a little bit more likely to like reject literature and uh, try to see if I can make things work by myself. So, um, any more questions? 
So, so let me check the time real quick. So it's 7:55. Um, I would kind of like to talk about some of some of these uh, some of these protocols. Um, so, so, uh, but I'm not sure h how long you guys want me to go. But basically, the way the way that all of them work is they have is they have a, a particular structure. They have these things called like bets or blocks, and they're made with they're, they kind of have three components. One of them is like an estimate, which you know is kind of the point of our protocol. Another one is called the sender, which is like something from V. V is like the set of validators. Uh, so like we have named entities making these messages in these protocols, and then we have these things called the ju a justification. And the justification actually is uh, is kind of a, a, a set of bets. So it's kind of like a view, right? And somehow the way that this is going to work is that I'm going to define, I'm going to say like, okay, the, a bet is valid only if the estimate is justified in the justification. And for the binary one, what, 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 what's going to happen is in the justification, um, I, uh, there has to, so if, if I choose a one here in the justification, a majority by weight of the validators have to have also chosen one. If I choose zero, a majority of the validators by weight have to have also chosen zero. So um, to, to give a slight visual, to give like a visualization of this, the way that I kind of normally draw this is I have I draw a DAG, where basically I have um, some validators v2 to v3, and they have weights by the way, which I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, so every so basically so we have we have we have this structure for these bets, um, and then we also have this thing called a weight, which is a map from the validators to the positive real numbers. Um, it's more like how many deposits they have, but sort of, yeah, safe, yeah. Um, and and then so and so and so what the way I represent this is by is basically by drawing nodes on the graph. Um, um, basically, something like this. So this is kind of like an example, maybe. Um, and 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 somehow like these these no these are represent bets from this validator. These represent bets from those validators, and these represent bets from that validator. And what I do is I'll write inside here. I will write um, their estimates. And here, because of the way I drew this, unfortunately, they're all one. Uh, because, because basically, it, this guy included this, in, this guy in his justification, and a majority of the weight there had said one. This guy included these two in their justification, and the majority of the weight there was one. And this one included those three, and the majority there was one, and so on. Um, and so, and so, and so, this is kind of how I graphically represent this structure, which is basically like a, set, or rather, a set of these things. Um, and and uh, the, uh, kind of something something to, to to note is that I have this definition of equivocation. So two nodes. So 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 I'd say B one is an equivocation of B two. Uh, basically, kind of like if and only if a few things. Um, so B1, uh, I'm just going to I'm going to use B1 dot V. So they have the same sender, and also um, uh, neither of them are in each other's uh, justification. Um, and actually, I, I I didn't quite tell you quite the truth here. It's not that they're not in each other's justification. They're not in the closure of each other's justification. So not only do we look like one layer down, but we keep looking many layers. So and like to draw the closure rather than do crazy stuff, I'm just gonna like like I'm just gonna put a big C here, just so that you kind of have an idea that that's what I mean. And so and so if two if if there's two bets from a validator, neither of which include the, each other in their closed justification, then that's an equivocation. An equivocation represents a Byzantine fault because it represents claiming or committing to have seen a particular set of messages and then later or a claiming not to have seen them right so like if you have a single thread uh, where, where you're kind of always including your previous bet in the justification then uh, your your the closure of your justification is going to be a constantly growing thing but if you don't have that property you might have two two closures of justifications that aren't included in each other and this this corresponds to this Byzantine behavior called equivocation 
Um, and then that, that's, super, that's super relevant uh, because uh, Byzantine nodes can equivocate, and this is a way to like, kind of attack the protocol. Um, and so let's, let's look at so, some examples for the binary consensus. So um, imagine if we have these same three nodes as, as, as before, and they each initially choose um, uh, an estimate of one. Now somehow, if there's no Byzantine faults, if there's no equivocation, then there's, there's no way that our estimate watching this will ever change from one. Because like, say, if, they, they, if this guy, like, pa if they pass messages around, if they pa they're only ever going to see a majority of one. And so like, we're stuck at one, and one is safe. And therefore, in the context of no Byzantine faults, it would be safe to choose one. However, imagine if this node is Byzantine. What they can do is they make another bet with zero. But without kind of no, there's no arrow here, so that so that this is this is kind of fully justified because like, uh, if a bet has a null justification, then they can kind of it can kind of go either way, and 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 this way, remember we had wait four here. Um, this node can convince this one of zero, and then like these two together can convince this one of zero. So somehow, with one Byzantine fault. We were, there was a possible future for the protocol that where the majority switched from one to zero. Actually, it could have stopped here because um, three plus four is more than five. And somehow, because we, because we were able to change the estimate from one to zero, then it obviously wasn't safe, right? And so, and so this type of algorithm for changing the estimate from one to zero is exactly the type of algorithm that we're going to use or that I have used to implement the estimate safety oracle. Uh, and and, and you know, um, here's here's another really interesting one. Um, um, let's do one, 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 and kind of have them all see each other's messages, so that they each they all choose one again. But now they've all seen each other's messages. Now all of a sudden, this f equivocation, like if this guy made it was zero here, wouldn't be able to convince it, either of these guys because they've seen more ones than zeros. Now, and if this guy also equivocated, somehow they, they also can't convince this one, right? Uh, because there's just as much weight, there's actually more weight on one than zero. And so somehow this state was able to tolerate two Byzantine faults. But oh no, the maximum Byzantine faults that should ever be allowed is one third, right? And like somehow, like, but somehow clearly two Byzantine faults were not enough to change the estimate here from one to zero. But if you have three, then all of a sudden, uh, you know, and if this guy sees all three of them, say, then like somehow they get a choice between zero and one because they have equal weight, and so then they could have chosen zero, uh, and so like here, like somehow it was a tie, um, and and so and so this kind of shows you what I was saying earlier about there being protocol states where we can tolerate more than a third fault. Now, if we had these two nodes be faulty from the start and never produce any messages, and like we only had like this one guy making messages. Obviously, we never could have gotten to that that, that thing. But it's kind of not an issue once we already have it. So that's kind of cool, kind of exciting, um, and hopefully gives you an idea of how of how this works. Uh, and then for the ordinal number, what I'm going to do instead is have is have a slightly different story, where basically instead of having just a binary thing, uh, I'm going to use like sigma for an ordinal number. I have an estimate. Oh yeah, let me go back. So here. So here, with, for the binary, I had for the binary. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna uh, draw sideways. I hope no one minds. The estimate was equal to basically either zero or one. Um, and uh, yeah, so let me actually let me just draw here zero or one. So basically, th this 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 in this protocol, uh, the estimate was only is only allowed to be zero or, zero or one. Um, for the ordinal number. Uh, the estimate is instead allowed to be order on some set of things, right? Um, and oops, and then we still have senders and justifications. Only now, instead of having the estimate be the majority here, we're going to do a, a ranked voting election. Uh, there's a bunch of ranked voting election protocols out there, um, and basically, somehow E needs to be the result of the ranked voting on 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 J, and uh, on the latest bets as seen from the other validators on J. And so, uh, and, 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 but ranked voting, unfortunately, has this result called arrows and possibility, uh, which is kind of a cool thing, arrows and possibility theorem, uh, which basically means that, like, somehow, which ends up meaning that, actually, it becomes really hard to implement this adversary that was trying to change the, the order of things. 
um, because of this, like, you know, you can't actually have independent of, independence of, alternative, of independent alternatives. So that even if, like, if for everyone, A comes before B, it could be that, like, some new thing is introduced that, like, may, means that, like, we have to not have A become before B in order to get rid of cycles. Because, like, you know, in, 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 in ordinal numbers, we can't, you know, we're gonna, I'm talking about having a total order here. Um, so I'm not talking about partial orders. So maybe it's not quite actually a full ordinal number, my bad. Uh, I guess I just don't really know that much about ordinal numbers, and I shouldn't be talking about them, sorry. <laughs> and and so, so the blockchain, though, is, is somehow much different and, 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 and ends up being super elegant. So the way the, block, the blockchain one works is basically um, you have, again, the same thing, you know, estimate, validator, send, uh, validate, uh, senders, and justifications, but, uh, but now the estimate is, um, this is kind of, it kind of is like the best block. So the best block is kind of the block on the head of the, be the chain with the, most, with the most score. And somehow, if the block you chose there is not the block that is justified by your justification, then, um, then, 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 then you kind of uh, have made an invalid block, and you could lose your whole deposit for that. Uh, and the way this works is kind of neat. Basically, we, have, like, we might have some genesis block here. Uh, and then validators will build different blocks on top of it. So here I am going to assume that I have four validators, like one, two, three, four. Um, and then the way that my the fork choice is going to work is it's very much exactly along the line of ghost. I look here, and I basically decide between these forks, which one do I choose? Well, I choose the one where there's more weight based on the latest blocks that we've seen from people. So this guy's latest block is on this one. This guy's latest block is on this one. Uh, this guy's latest block is on this one. So basically, like each of these three validators have a latest block here, and we're on, whereas only one validator has a latest block there, and so like the fork choice rule says go here. And then here, uh, there's like two latest validators on this side, and only one there, and we're gonna assume that those have more weight, and so we kind of go this way, and here we have no choice, and so we go this way. And so somehow like this is the best block. And if you have this in your justification, and you, the thing you have here is not that guy, then you've made an invalid block. And so um, the other thing to realize is that, like, uh, for a block, we're also going to have kind of uh, we're also going to have transactions. But I kind of leave this out of the story because it doesn't affect the reasoning about consensus at all. Um, and, and so we have a rule for how to choose the estimates given the justification, and then we can do a very similar type of thing that we did before in terms of trying to make people pick a different fork. So imagine if again we have like. So like a genesis, the genesis block is somehow like not from any of the validators, so you need to think of it somehow separately. And we have like the validator one, make a block on that one, and uh, validator three also. And then validator one uh, make, gives a block to validator two, and then and, and so it, right here. So 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 now somehow, this is the best block, right? Because all of the all of the validators' weights are on this fork. Which means that, like, you know, I definitely have to go that way, and then here I have no choice, and this is the best block. However, um, if this validator saw this block, they would to they would totally switch to that one because this validator has more weight than that one, and they've ha they've only seen like kind of their own block; they haven't seen anything else. And now this validator would switch to this one because these two these two have more weight than that one because it's the only thing I'd seen before. And which means that similarly, this valid, this one was switched to that one, and so somehow this was the best block. But the question of whether, say, this block would be in the longest chain in the future ended up being the answer being ended up being no, because look, there is a future where this block ends up being in the longest chain. So somehow this block is not safe. Um, on the other hand, if we were to do something else, something actually. A lot simpler. Uh, let me forget this because I, I want to say that they're not equivocating. If we did something a little bit simpler and just like never imagine that this guy never happened, um, now actually this block is safe because there's no way for any of them to see a blockchain that doesn't include this block, which means that like at least in the context of no Byzantine faults. Uh, this block will be in all future, all future states in the longest chain. And so somehow it's safe to decide that block is always going to be there. And so that's kind of the story there. It's a very similar consensus protocol to the other ones, only um, the adversary calculation ends up being tractable. 
And so somehow, it end, or more attractive, it ends up being po somehow more possible to, to, to figure out if things are safe. Um, but definitely what we'll, be, what we'll be able to show here is that at least there exists protocol states that are safe, which is great because then like somehow that's the minimum that's required to show that this is a consensus protocol because it's somehow possible for them to achieve safety. Um, and then for the last one, what I, what I kind of have done is like rather than have uh, just a blockchain, I have this rewrite system. And a rewrite system is kind of this really neat thing. It's an abstract computational notion where basically like you can rewrite, you have like a grammar and an equivalence relation and you rewrite terms according to a reduction, a reduction rule. Things like the lambda calculus, the pi calculus, how, how kind of use this type of thing. And basically what I'm gonna do there is instead of having uh, a blockchain where everything kind of needs to be chained in like a, in a sequential way. I'm going to have a concurrent execution schedule for these reduction rules, such that any way that you execute the schedule, you end up with the same state in the end. Uh, and the way this kind of like I, I, I'm not 100% sure what the best way to 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 represent this is, but uh, is but I kind of like end up doing something like this. Like I imagine that there's like a, a genesis kind of frontier of which is, which basically represents like the terms in, in in our rewrite rule, and then and then every block kind of what it does is it, it, it kind of gets rid of something and rewrites it with like something else. And so somehow we end up get, get getting these blocks that, you know, these ones don't need to be ordered, but sometimes, uh, sometimes what's gonna happen, you know, even, even if I have like one here, I rewrites these two and creates this thing. Um, so like these two are gone, these surfaces are gone and now that's part of the new frontier. This, this is all fine. We can all, uh, we can, if you execute like this one, and then this one, and then that one, or this one, and then that one, and that one, you end up with the same end front, like frontier at the end of the process. But now what can happen is kind of if two, if two blocks end up trying to write to this, uh, overwrite the same piece, so imagine I have like this block here, it kind of writes of that, and like this, and it gives me like this, uh, this thing, and, and, and I have one here that just, that just overwrites all this, and gives me this. These two blocks, they're kind of overriding the same state. They're in contention, right? There's like an issue here. Only one of those can actually be part of the concurrent execution schedule because only one of those ends up being, uh, well, then, because we can't actually, in any, in any way that is consistent with the rules of the rewrite system, execute both those rewrites because each rewrite con like consumes the thing that's being overwritten. And so now we, need to, we have the fork choice kind of problem. Like, how do we choose between these? And the answer is kind of very similar as before. We look at the like, lot latest bets as made by the, all the validators and see where there's more weight. And if there's more weight on one than the other, then somehow uh, we have to pick that one. And then, and then so, so we have this block system again, a rewrite system. Um, and we have an uh, estimate, which here is going to be an actual uh, a rewrite and a sender and a justification. And basically what we're going to need is for this guy to be a rewrite on top of a schedule that is, that is the result of these kind of fork choice rules made every time there's a contention. And so, there's a, the, so, so this process gives you like a best schedule from which any given justification, and you, any reduction that you make has to be on, t on, t on the top, on the, on the term that results from executing that best schedule. And somehow, actually, it turns out that um, the adversary that we use here for, sorry, for the blockchain, ends up doing pretty much exactly the same thing. We basically just try to move the terms from like one schedule to another. When you ask something like, hey, like, you know, is this frontier going to be part, is this frontier, or is this frontier going to be part of the best schedule forever? Um, and so that's, so, so that kind of, you know, uh, you know, this one I wasn't, I don't want to do it in as much detail because it's going to take, take a little while to show you everything, but somehow, it's really cool, right? Because like all of these protocols satisfy the same safety proof, um, and all of them, uh, you know, and the safety proof is quite simple, and all of them just kind of required a refactoring of the data structures that are underlying. Uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, I, I kind of gave these data structures, said when they're valid, uh, and then and then and then gave, gave some kind of process for. Uh, oh, sorry, define what estimates are. Like here, it was like the fact that the one is going to be forever or zero is going to be forever. Uh, the ordinal number one is going to be the, the fact that, um, you know, this term is always before that term. Uh, and the, uh, the blockchain one is that like this block will always be in the longest chain. And for the schedule, it's that a particular section of, an inter of a frontier, like an intermediate one, is always going to be part of the best schedule in the future. 
And so just by kind of refactoring these definitions, we were able to kind of generate new consensus protocols that, uh, you know, by virtue of having this estimate safety, consensus safety trick, um, um, you know, are correct in the sense that they actually are safe. And so that's kind of the end of the story. Um, I'll also take more questions, but I guess I want to go to my concluding slide. You know, thanks for listening. Yeah. Um, yeah, just say your question and I'll repeat it. No, that's not right at all. I mean, so for example, uh, so this one I showed, well, this, 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 this one, uh, this particular state, uh, it doesn't tolerate a Byzantine fault. However, uh, if, if say I were to do this, all of a sudden, there's no, there, all of a sudden it does. And so the, 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 the thing is that like, uh, the number of Byzantine faults that are tolerated by, by, by like, you know, so a particular estimate, and this one I'm saying, like, oh, this guy is in the long, longest chain, can tolerate a different number of faults depending on the state of the protocol. And you, and you, have, to, and you have to kind of detect it, right? The estimate safety, I, I represent an estimate safety as a binary question, but in fact, it's a binary question for every Byzantine fault profile, and somehow you have to say, oh, look, it's safe only if there's more than some amount. So, like, so this now has safety, in that, in, in that this guy can't equivocate to change this guy's mind. Uh, you know. So you can measure it predictably which state and you can base your decisions based on that measure. Yeah. So if you can measure it, then you can base your decisions. And like, you know, I kind of claim that we can measure it, but there is one of the big challenges with this approach is actually implementing the oracle that does do these measurements. Because um, I mean the, the, the algorithm that I'm show that I kind of follow here is it's kind of a somewhat brute force. It's not actually brute force. I have a, I have a strategy for how to change these 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 estimates, but uh, it ends up being, uh, you know, some people don't like the computational complexity of it. It's, it's n squared to the number of nodes, um, but there are always going to be um, there's always there's al we can always use a template approach where basically anything that fits a template is known to have this amount of fault tolerance, and have we have a whole bunch of templates, and then we just check if the templates fit, and then so that way we don't have to do a lot of computationally complex things. Sorry? Exactly, kind of like a rainbow table, yeah, or a memo table. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are you planning to use this I mean, I am, but I still haven't sold any, everyone on it, so, you know, it's not like, it's not like it's a, I mean, we're still way early in the, in the consensus process, you know. I'm, you know, I'm still working on the proposal, and there needs to be, like, debate, and then consensus, uh, or else, like, you know, it's not guaranteed, but certainly, like, I'm not going to stop, you know. Uh, no, I mean I only came up with like this last one like a couple weeks ago, like less than a month ago, and so I'm, uh, and I'm, 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 and I'm bad at documenting stuff, but it's gonna happen. Sorry. Well, which Casper are you talking about? Oh, uh, so the the the, the first Casper is gonna be Vitalik's like finality gadget Casper, and uh, and it should be ready by the end of the year. And then in terms of the rest of the stuff, it's, it's a little bit harder to tell because, uh, I'm, I mean, I know it's all correct. That doesn't mean it's performance, whereas Vitalik's thing is, like, clearly performant. Um, sorry. Um, what was your question initially? I don't think I repeated it. Yeah, yeah. I know, but I want to repeat it for the camera. Oh, yeah. So the question was... The, the, the first question, for the sake of anyone who's, who's listening online or something, is, you know, is it, is it right that, this, the, that the blockchain protocol is in Byzantine fault tolerant? And the kind of realization was that, like, no, it is, but maybe this particular state of the protocol isn't. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so... Yeah, yeah. So the question, right? So, the, so the question is like, you know, I haven't talked about bets and what are like the penalties and penalties and risk rewards for the bets. And so actually, like, you know, when I say block, uh, block and bet are kind of actually interchangeable in this in this world. But I could, we can we can actually separate them out a little bit. But somehow, actually, um, what we've found is that it is unsafe to make people lose money for behavior that could be honest 
uh, but just incorrect due to asynchrony. And so what ended up, ended up happening is there's, there's a few things that can happen. One of them is um, you know, for safety, right? E there's two safety faults. Either you equivocate or you make an invalid bet, i.e. it's not justified, then you lose all of your money. And then there's like, and, and, that, and that's kind of clear cut. Uh, but if you, if you only make valid bets, then you don't lose money for that. You're only gonna lose money for lack of liveness. And lack of liveness kind of occurs when, say, you know, where this kind of, this kind of back and forth continues forever. So you can imagine like this, and then, uh, you know, like this. So you can have a constantly switching from one chain to the other, and that's like a liveness fault. And for liveness faults, we are going to penalize because we want to incentivize liveness. And that is actually a much more complicated story. It's not about whether your bet was right or not. It's about whether or not you made the messages that were, you were expected to make. And so you know, the, 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 while we did initially start off a lot of this journey on with, with the idea that we're making bets that where you put money up, now you put money up. And if you, as long as you make bets in a valid way, you don't lose money for safety. But you might still lose money for liveness. Um, and, 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 and so, uh, which it turns out to be much safer for participants, which means that it's much more uh, efficient for clients because they don't need to pay as much for any given level of security. Um, so somehow, uh, the bettiness of the protocol has declined since we've like, learned a lot about consensus. And since we found that consensus is actually quite an objective thing. Um, any other questions? Sorry, that question, I don't remember, did I repeat it? Uh, the question is like how, like uh, uh, you know, how do you, how do people lose money or make money from from making bets? Any other questions? Going once, going twice, we're done.